Okay, so what we've covered so far in this class is first week we covered what is biblical theology, and we began to describe how it's an understanding of the Bible as a whole. It's a, looking at the Bible from a historical aspect instead of a theological or topical aspect. It's, it, it's con biblical theology is concerned about the storyline. Systematic theology is concerned about the bottom line. And we went over a week of definition, introduction, and then we went through what are the tools that are needed. And if you look on your outline on the, on the back side of the outline is that outline for the class. We went over exegetical tools, how we understand the grammar and the historical background when we read the, the scripture. Then we begin to go through biblical theology tools. How do we understand covenant, prophecy, and its multiple horizons of fulfillment? How it, the, the Bible is understood by um, the promise fulfillment aspects of the scripture and typology. And then we begin in weeks five and six to begin to integrate our biblical theology with our systematic theology. How do those things still go together? Last week we talked about how our exegesis and our hermeneutics, they, they form our biblical theology. And our biblical theology, it then helps us form our systematic theology and how all these things are, must be united in order to understand the Bible rightly by timeline and by topic. Now this week, we're going to think more in week six about how systematic theology integrates with our biblical theology. And we're going to think specifically this week about what is theology in general. Okay? And this will help our understanding of biblical theology and systematic theology. So the things that we're going to cover this morning are how everyone has a systematic theology. What is doctrine in general? Two, how do we think theologically? And then finally... How do we apply theology in the local church? Okay? So, have you ever heard the phrase, um, what God has joined together, let not man separate? I know Brother Jesse's heard that phrase. <laughs> he Twice. He's heard it twice. <laughs> Both times he was thinking about Maria. He didn't hear that. but So now maybe he can hear, hear and understand it. <laughs> what God has joined together, let not man separate. Theology and practice are married together. Okay? Theology and practice are married. What God has joined together, let not man separate. What happens when you have just theology and no practice connected with it? Dead religion? Head knowledge without heart knowledge? Give me a practical example. I'll start to get dangerous and pick people out if, you, if no one raised their hand. Oh, Ben, save the day. Okay. The, so knowing the right thing about the interrelations with the church, but, and, but not loving the brothers. And that's just good old-fashioned hypocrisy, right? Okay, what if you try and have good practice with, without theology? Keith? A zeal without knowledge. Okay. Give me a practical example. Nikita? Yes, I was thinking the same, the same thing. <laughs> you can get a charismatic church that has the music blaring and has the people jumping, and, but it's not grounded in the truth. Jack? Licentiousness. Licentiousness. Tell me, how, how can that be um, practiced without theology? So 
So practice then becomes defined just by our feelings and what we think, and instead of the theological base of what God says. And then so um, we live, people live whatever they want. Okay, so by way of introduction, in everyone has a systematic theology, first we're going to think through um, some practical problems and then the theological solution. Okay, so I'm trying to root this in the, in the scripture. Um, if, if we take a practical problem, say pride. Okay, so... Sometimes some of us are prone one way or another. Some of us are prone to think great thoughts about theology and like to sit down at a dinner table and debate people about theology and then they have a lack of practice. Or some people are prone to, give me something practical. What kind of teaching do you want? I want practical. Give me something help for my day. Help me organize my um, life with my kids. Help me know how to better um, live. Both of those extremes are not right. Both of those extremes are not right. And they should be, theology and practice should be linked closely together. We shouldn't talk about great theology without thinking about how does that affect our lives. And we shouldn't think about, I'm going to try and live for the Lord without thinking about the, the theological basis for that. Okay? So what, what I'm going to do now is we're going to pick out a few topics. Pride, lust, anger, and apathy. Then we're going to think about what does the Bible say about them and what is the theological basis then for the, or the theological solution. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 4. Okay, Daniel, would you read 1 Corinthians 4, 6 to 7? Okay, so when you think through the reason for which a lot of the letters in the scriptures are written, often they're written because of a practical problem. There's division in the church at Corinth. There is um, the two ladies in Philippi, Eusindike and... What's the other one? Iota? <laughs> we'll get there, we'll get there, and I'll pronounce, pronounce it right. I'm sorry. When you think about these practical problems, um, they're often the reason for which the Apostle Paul is write, writing the letter. And he doesn't start out his letters with talking about the practical problem, typically. What does he start out with? Yeah, theology, a theological basis. And then he, you see he's, how he, we see how he's very logical. He gets, sets the theological basis, and then he gets to the practical problem in which he needs to write to, but it's informed with the right understanding. So what's the basis in 1 Corinthians that's, that he sets before he gets into practical problems? You remember from chapters 1 and 2? What does he talk about? Yes, worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. And what's godly wisdom but the gospel? He begins to remind them about the, the wisdom of God is the gospel. Or that's what he calls the, the foolishness of God is wiser than the, the wisdom of men. Okay, so in applying that then here, 
he gives the 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 ultimate shot to pride. What do you have that you did not receive? What's the answer? Nothing. Nothing. So why now? Well, if you did indeed receive it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? You know, pride seems like a complicated problem. But what's the theological basis for it? For the solution, but is the gospel, or in theological terms, soteriology, right? I'm going to abbreviate. So, pride is going to be answered by a right understanding of the gospel. You remember the same is in Romans 3? Where he talks about the gospel, and then where to, at the end of the chapter he says, where then is boasting? It is excluded. You see how a, the, a practical problem is answered by a theological basis? Nikita? Soteriology is the, the theological description of um, what it, the doctrine of salvation. So this is a class about theology. So I'm trying to link it together with your minds to show you that this is a very practical and helpful class and then how to rightly think about theology in general. Okay, so if you take the same thing with, we'll try and move at a little faster pace. We're going to take lust, okay? Well, in second thought, let's take anger first. Okay, we take anger and then let's th think about that practical problem and what is the solution? Turn to Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Let all bitterness wrath, anger, clamor. What's clamor? Arguing, yep, loud screaming. And evil speaking, be put away from you with all malice. What's malice? What's that? Hate, okay. Bad, yes, bad intentions. Okay, let all that be put away from you. And instead, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. In the context here, how do we understand how God forgave us? Claudia? Yes, he died on the cross. We can understand that from chapter 2 of Ephesians, right? Fill out more the, the theology of what Paul means by as God and Christ forgave you. What's another point from Ephesians? So we see the work of the Trinity in salvation, how he elects some before the foundation of the world, and then how he gives his son to die on the cross. And we see that in Ephesians 1 and 2. So it's informing our application of when we struggle with anger, then there's a theology of the gospel, soteriology, and a... Um, an understanding of how that applies to our anger. That if God has forgiven us, when, we, when he had the right to be angry with us, how can we be angry towards others? If you apply your theology, then it destroys anger. You see? You, you can't just say, give me practical stuff. You need theology and practice. Okay, so if you take the same with lust, continue on in the same passage, and 
He says in, in chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children and walk in love, as Christ also loved us and given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Okay, do you see the theology there that God has given up Christ as an offering and a sacrifice? It's full of Old Testament meaning of what Christ did on the cross, an atoning sacrifice. He, this is the picture of love. This is what it means to love, the, the cost that, that God and Christ paid. But in contrast, but fornication, sex outside of marriage, all uncleanliness or covetousness, covetousness off here applied to immorality. All, this is all three different terms for immorality, general terms. Let it not even be named among you as fitting for the saints. Okay, so there's the immoral acts in, in three. In, in verse four, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which is not fitting. So you've got a filthy mouth in verse four. Okay, the filthy acts in verse 3 or the filthy mouth in verse 4 should not be done. But instead, what, what takes its place? Thanks. How in the world can being thankful help with lust? Keith? That's right. That's right. Covetousness is linked with lust, a desire to have what's not yours. And the answer is being content in thanksgiving. And thanksgiving for what? In context, yes, we don't deserve anything because of the gospel, because of how Christ gave himself for us an offering and a, to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Do you see the, the, the lust is a worship issue? It has a theological ba basis in thanksgiving because of the gospel of how the, the, the sacrifice that God has given, or in theological terms, our soteriology. Okay? The, the, wow, that clock went fast. Okay, we're going to have to keep on moving on with our outline, or we're never going to get done with this class. <laughs> okay, you get the point, right? Okay, if you have practical problems, then there, and every one of us, we have practical problems. We need a theological basis. We need to renew our minds to think the way the Bible tells us to think because of the truths in the Bible. And that what God has joined together, let not man separate. Either way, okay? Okay, so um, now looking at our outline. Um, the, the quote, I'm not going to bother to read because you can read that on your own. That's, um, I've done the same point as a quote through this use of the, um, taking you through some practical topics. Okay, so then let's move on to the first point. What is doctrine? Doctrine then is a precise and accurate summary of what the Bible says on a topic that defines the difference between truth and error, orthodoxy and heresy. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to say that again slow that you, so you can write it down. That's why you have the outline in your hand. Doctrine is a precise and accurate summary of what the Bible says on a topic that defines the difference between truth and error, orthodoxy and heresy. Okay, so th theology is general, can be generally divided into... Um, in different ways. Here in the outline, we have a very general gui guideline to say theology can be divided into biblical knowledge, personal knowledge, and situational knowledge. The biblical knowledge, it can be referred to knowledge of God. Personal knowledge, knowledge of ourselves. Situational knowledge, knowledge of all nature. That kind of covers everything, right? Um, God, us, and what he's made. That simplifies things, right? Okay, so the knowledge of God, the biblical knowledge of God, isn't something that you just know. It's not intuitive. Or the knowledge about yourself. Some people say, who knows? I know, um, I know myself. Well, you know, there's someone who knows you better than you know yourself. God. And he's written his word. Your knowledge about yourself is not intuitive. It doesn't come just on your 
um, just by the experience, or instead we have a the Word of God that informs us about God. It's the same with, okay, so first thinking about God. Um, we learn in the Scripture that a relationship and knowing Him is not like knowing, simply studying a topic, like we would study some topic of science, like um, studying the taxonomy of an animal or studying um, chemistry. We cannot just simply know God and have a knowledge of God that is simply theoretical or simply um, because he's a person. It's something that you, you know based on the Bible and you have a relationship with him to know him. The theology and practice. We, we remember he is creator, Lord, he is holy, he is a spirit. And because of these things, it demands reverence, obedience, worship. It, the knowledge of God is not like the knowledge of you just learn something and it doesn't impact your life. Because we learn of who God is, everything about we learn about who God is must affect us and must affect our lives. His creator means he's the one who owns us. He's Lord over all. We, he's our king. We must submit to him. He's holy, so we cannot continue in sin. He is spirit. He's not like us. So this demands reverence, obedience, and worship. So then, point two, personal knowledge. Theological knowledge is going to be personal. It's going to help us relate and understand ourselves. Um, I'll read the, the Calvin quote. Nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. But while joined with by many bonds, which, which one proceeds and brings forth, the other is not easy to discern. The knowledge of ourselves not only arouses us to seek God, but also, as it were, leads us by the hand to find him. It is certain that man never achieves a clear knowledge of himself until he first looked upon God's face and then descends from contemplating him to scrutinize himself. Okay, to give you a practical example of what Calvin is talking about here, he's saying, in order to know yourself, you've got to know God. And when you know God, it helps you know yourself. These two things are linked together. For example, if you begin to know God in the, in the law of God, you learn that he is not a liar, but he wants you to tell the truth. You learn that he is, not, he is always faithful, so he commands you to be faithful in your marriage, not to commit adultery. You learn that, um, that there are not many gods, but there is only one God. You learn the character of God, and then in turn that shows you yourself that you're a liar and a thief and an adulterer at heart. Does that make sense? You see how they're linked together? When you know, begin to know God, then you begin to know yourself. When you begin to see how sinful you are, then it begins you to seek God. They go back and, back and forth. The knowledge of one leads to the knowledge of the other. Then we know of all the things the Lord has made through our point three in the outline of under what is doctrine, situational knowledge, all nature, and culture, all things of angels, all things of um, how we're to live, all of um, the world around us, why we're here, is all known through the scripture and must be categorized. Okay, so then let's think through how to the think theologically, okay? So besides just personal, practical Besides practical problems, we're going to pick out some issues in life on how to think theologically. Okay, so first off, give me theological categories. Okay? So, Wes, what's a theological category? Like from a systematic theology. Okay, we got pneumatology. Forgive me for my spelling. I am a mechanic after all. <laughs> yeah, the worst was, especially in front of others, I spelled really bad. Worst, one, one group, I misspelled my wife's name on the board. 
Yes. <laughs> it's okay to laugh. It was, it was <laughs> That's why I said it. So, okay, so pneumatology. Give me um Clyde, give me another theological category. Okay? What's that mean? Okay? Dale, give me another theological category. Yeah, in the terms. We're thinking through systematic theology terms. Soteriology? Okay, a Christology? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> no biology. <laughs> Eschatology, okay. Thank you, Glad. I'm not the only one who's laughed at today. <laughs> okay, so we have some categories here. How about we could add um, a biblical anthropology? What's that? Okay, so how the Bible talks about us, the study of man. What about... Um, Harmartiology. Does anyone know that one? What's that? Study of sin? Don't take any of my spelling here. This is just representative, okay? <laughs> Look it up on your phone to get the spelling right. If I didn't have spell check, then what would my papers look like? Okay, so now we have theological categories. We're under the section in the outline of how to think through theologically, okay? How to think through issues theologically. When you understand the different categories of what the, um, remember what the, we're talking about systematic theology and in general, in order to apply it to our overall class of biblical theology. So when we think through systematic theology categories, what does the Bible say in the bottom line? What does the Bible say about the Holy Spirit? What does the Bible say about the church? What does the Bible say about salvation? What does the Bible say about Christ? What does the Bible say about the end times? What does the Bible say about man? What does the Bible say about sin? When you get those bottom lines, then how does it under, inform your, the issues through the day? So I'm going, cause this is kind of like how the introduction started, I'm going reverse. Instead I'm starting with theology, and then I'm, we're gonna think how to think through a practical issue because of our knowledge here. Okay, if I take what everybody's talking about, right, ISIS. Give me some theological categories and how that should apply to a right understanding of what's happening. Jonathan? Okay, so our harmatiology should inform when someone says, how could, Jonathan, yeah, it works. Jonathan, how could someone be, say they worship God and they're worshiping God by cutting people's heads off. I think all religions should be thrown out the drain. How would your theology of harmartiology help answer that objection and think rightly? Yes, yeah, so Jonathan is, is saying the false God that's pre presented because of a sin in the heart produces this, um, uh, this evil fruit. Idolatry, the theology and practice are linked. And Jonathan is taking the theology of, the, of sin and how it's developed and linking it with their idolatry, their, their horrible blasphemous Christology, Right? You see how he, Jonathan just took both of these and applied it to understand, theologically understand this current issue. So we have to have our understanding of the bottom line of what the bo scripture says about topics. In other words, your theology right in order to understand a practical issue. Okay, so next one. How do I rightly understand rest? trying to pick as random a topics and not linked in order to make you think through 
This is like Jeopardy, you know. Do, 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 do. What is yada, 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 yada? Random topics in order to make you think through and apply your theology. Yes, Grace? Okay, how does eschatology apply to rest? The eternal rest. Ah, we have a theologian. She's been taught by Mr. Dodge. <laughs> okay, so a biblical understanding of eschatology, that there is an ultimate rest that's coming. What do we have today that's a practice and a picture of that ultimate rest? Josh? Today? Yes, the Sabbath. I was like, what, today? <laughs> He's too deep for me. <laughs> yes, today is a practice. Today, the Sabbath is a practice and a picture of the rest to come because of what Christ has done. Go ahead, Josh. Yes, so the rest we have in Christ it connects it with our soteriology, our understanding of salvation. So if you were to think through rest in a, maybe in a biblical categories, you could kind of go through how the Lord is the first one who set up that, that day of rest by the example and how he makes the world and on the seventh day he rests. And then how he sets up rest throughout the, the festivals and the feasts, time set aside to stop work instead to rest physically and set your mind on what the Lord has done. Or you can think through the Ten Commandments and how that day of rest is commanded for the people of God. And you, you go through time and you kind of see a biblical theology of rest. And we see how it's, it's something that's set aside for times. It's not to be abused, right? There's the abuse of rest, where you rest when you should be working. Right? Good old-fashioned laziness. And that's not what the Lord set up, but he set up a time, a time to rest, but not all the time is rest. There's a wonderful balance. He's very kind to us in that way, right? So that you think through that you don't have, some people can have a bad, a bad conscience about rest at all. They think, what could I have accomplished in that time? And so then instead they try and work, 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 and then they end up binging on rest. Oh, I'll just um, watch TV for four hours. And they, bin they binge on rest, and then they stop, and they're like, oh, I feel so guilty because I binged on rest. And then they'll think, I'm going to be workaholic again. I'm going to work, 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 and they work as much as they can. Instead, there's a wisdom applied in the way the Lord set up rest, one in seven. So you work hard through six, and you have one day set aside for rest. And you see, if you plan it out, if you apply your theology to your practice, and you plan it out, then you won't abuse it but yet you will still have it in your schedule. Okay, so another topic. Um, let's think through um, does God judge? Yes, God, yes is the answer, okay. How do you know? I don't think God judges. I'm uh, your... Mother, you know, I'm trying to pick someone out of your life, Keith. Um, someone who thinks God doesn't judge. God doesn't judge. How would your theology un inform your understanding of this topic? Yes, our Christology and our soteriology that the Lord Jesus Christ suffered the wrath uh, the, uh, from God. So if the Lord would, if the Father would judge his own son, then um, it's the loudest declaration of his holiness and his, and his justice and his judgment. How else would we understand? What's another?
Yeah. That's right. So what Dan has done is he's, he's outlined a biblical theology of a, a history through the Bible, the, the storyline of the judgments of God in Exodus, the judgments of God, and talked about the Psalms, and how that informs our category uh, of theology in general, of who, who God is. Jonathan? Our eschatology, how would that relate to whether, who, how God judges? Yes, so the, in eschatology, there's the, the, the day of the Lord, the time in which his wrath will come on this world. Also part of our eschatology is our understanding of hell, is, part, is in this category of end times, because it's um, the, the final judgment. Daniel? Amen. I didn't you know, even think about that one. So the, if everyone could hear what Daniel said, the, the pneumatology, how the Holy Spirit comes in his work, and one of the things he does is he convicts of truth, of righteousness, and judgment. So a right understanding of, a, um, I'm trying to pick as random a topics as I can, so that when a, a random topic comes to you, you see what we're doing here? We're, we're showing, I'm showing you, how do you think theologically? How do you apply your categories to the topics in life? Sergio? Hamartiology? Hamartia in sin in Greek. Yes, so linking together the, his, his theology proper and hamartiology shows that God's holiness he must act in light of sin. Okay, so finally in our outline, theology in the local church. Theology in the local church. Um, theology not done in connection with the local church is dangerous. Theology done not, not done in the local church is dangerous. Okay, um, theology, some example, practical examples, not in the local church. You could, you could have somebody who sits in a seminary who writes and talks about theology all day and if he's not part of the local church and applying his theology out, then that becomes a very dangerous disconnect. Or you get the guy who sits in his garage, right? And what, what do we say? Bedside Baptist or um, where the guy doesn't go to church and you ask him, you know, um, why don't you go to church? Well, we're two or three are gathered. We're having church right here, right now, as we're talking, right? I don't have to go to church. I don't have to. I just sit in, you know, and watch TV. Or I get my theology off the internet. I'm going to be, learn my theology from Paul Washer and Tim Conway on YouTube. But I'm not going to be connected with the local church. Learning good theology about salvation. But the danger is if you're not in the local church, whether you're informed like a professor or whether you're uninformed like a guy who just watches YouTube, you are a great danger to say, I'm going to have a theology and not linked with the local church. Why is it helpful to link it with the local church? Give me some examples. Yes, accountable from error. What is the accountability that God has set up for heretics? What's that? That's right, Matthew 18. If one of us begins to say the Holy Spirit's not God, I believe that the, the Father's God and the, Spirit is, and the Son is God, but the Holy Spirit, I think, believe that he emanates from the Son, Son and the Father and that he is not, um, he is just part of their being, a force that comes out from them. How does the, what's the church's responsibility? <laughs> To point me out as a Jehovah Witness. <laughs> What's that? The correct, yes. We, we're going to need that correction from time to time. Even a Christian can begin to, can begin to 
dabble in and taste some sort of false theology, but they won't remain in it. And the means at which the Lord has given is the local church to hold each other accountable for our doctrine and for our practice. Josh? Yes, the, the purpose of the theology is linked with the practice. Well, God has joined together. You must not separate. And so if you just think that you think great thoughts about God, you will tend to think that those great thoughts no one else has ever thought. Because you know why? Because you're not talking with anybody else about it. <laughs> Any, anybody else sound. Anybody else informed. And where are you going to find those people? But in the church. It humbles you that the Lord is doing a work elsewhere. He's doing a work um, in other people, not just yourself. And you begin to see and begin to be informed. So in this lesson, do you, um, do you see that everyone has a systematic theology and it must be linked together with your, your theology, with your practice? What is doctrine? But it's the precise, accurate summary of what the Bible says about a topic. And it defines the difference between truth and error, orthodoxy and heresy. How do you think through issues theologically? You think about your categories, and you, then you apply what do these truths have to do with a, with a current topic. And then finally, that your theology must be linked with the local church. In applying it in the local church, in accountability in the local church, in practice in the local church, in being informed by the local church. God has made the church to be the pillar and ground of truth. So be together with one another, practicing your theology and, and, and growing in it. Okay? So next week we'll begin to get into some of the application of our biblical theology. We've learned some of the tools We've learned what it is in general. Now we're going to begin to apply it to some of the, the grand themes of the storyline of the Bible. Okay? Let's pray. Dear Lord, please help us to, to live out your word in humility. Please help us to be humble so that we grow in our understanding of, of systematic theology. Please help us to link it together. Every time we think about your truths, help it to, us to link it together with how that should change our lives. Help our practice and our lives to be based upon the rock of your word, not upon the, the shifting sands of feelings, emotions, experiences, or our own thoughts. Help us, Lord, to be rightly grounded on knowing your word and, and in much detail. Lord, I pray these things so that we would honor you and grow. Amen.